This week on The Futurists, Jennifer Palka. We are so eager to put in people who can dream up big ideas and so reluctant to actually value the skills of making those ideas real. Well, welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tersick, your host, and this week I'll be flying solo. Uh, the, we are taking another look at the trends that shape the future and the people who are driving those trends. And this week, we've got a different perspective for you. Often on this show, we're trying to reach the people who are doing things with their careers and with their lives that are going to deeply impact the future. Often we've interviewed people who are in the technology field, and sometimes we've interviewed people who are writing and thinking about the future. Um, But yet we haven't had an opportunity to talk to someone who's influenced government policy. And when it comes to the allocation of resources that shape the way the tech industry unfolds, really there are two great forces, not just the private markets, but also public governance. This week, we've got an expert on that topic joining us, someone I've known for a very long time and in recent years have come to greatly respect because of her accomplishments. She is someone who has started businesses, who's also worked in the government. She started nonprofit organizations. She has been the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States in the Obama White House. She's the founder of Code for America, a nonprofit organization that's been compared to the Peace Corps or Teach for America in the technology technology sector. She was selected by Wired Magazine as one of the most influential people in tech and by Forbes as one of the top 50 women in the technology field. She's the winner of the Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship, and she's the author of a new book that we're about to talk about. I'd like to welcome onto The Futurists, my friend, Jennifer Palka. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's really great to reconnect and to, uh, to be here with you. Thanks. It's great to see you again. Uh, it's been a while. We met a long time ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> man, I don't even want to think about that. In the 90s, so much has changed. Uh, but along the way, I've kept track of your progress, and I've been very impressed to see how you've taken what you've learned in one organization and applied it to the next and to the next and to the next. And so why don't we start with that? Tell us a little bit about your journey from Code for America uh, to what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, I I got interested in government um, sort of, you know, as Barack Obama was about to be elected president and everyone said, great, you know, the Internet, the participatory Internet, the this new Web 2.0 kind of world got this guy elected. And a lot of us were going great. Uh, can it help him govern? Right. It's it's a it's a sort of a different question. Um, so I started this organization uh, in 2010 to try to get tech talent to kind of help come in, understand the problems of, of really of service delivery and government. How does government interact with the public? Um, why are people so frustrated with their interactions with government when it's easy now to make you know interactions through apps and websites that are you know incredibly convenient and sort of delightful to use? And why are we doing that in government? So Code for America was my first attempt at that. Um, and, you know, it's it's an, it's an amazing organization that's still doing a lot and has changed a lot because we learned a lot along the way. Um, from there, it is sort of part of my arc has been bouncing between being on the inside and being on the outside. When I'm on the outside of government, I'm still working very closely with government. But that that started this 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 whole arc for me where, you know, only two years into Code for America, Todd Park, who was the chief technology officer of the U.S., said, you know, can you come in and help us uh, help us build something similar inside government? Um, and so that was really about institution building. Um, there was enormous resistance to having tech talent in the White House. The White House has some significant views about what's important. Uh, They love policy and implementation is not as important to them. And so getting them to say, we actually need people who know how to make the interfaces, make the technology, make the infrastructure that that helps government interact in in positive ways with the public was a real uphill battle. Mm -hmm. Um, But got that done, handed it off to some wonderful people who ran it and... um, uh, went back to Code for America, um, which, you know, where I stayed um, for until just before the pandemic. <laughs> um, I really think that the arc for me has been from 
how do you create, how do you get the talent there and get them empowered to do the right things, which is still ongoing to how do you go upstream and create the conditions under which these people can have greater impact? Mm. Because you have an enormous culture clash mm-hmm. between government and the tech world. And when the tech world brings these practices into government, you know, they're working in an environment that's really, really hostile. So uh, working on the Defense Innovation Board, the new organization, USDR, um, but and but particularly the book for me are now about how do I go upstream and really create the conditions that will allow this field to to flourish and and, and really have the impact that it needs to have. One of the criticisms of the U.S. government in particular is that it's dominated by attorneys. Most yes. of our elected representatives are attorneys and attorneys are very focused on process. Yes. Um, and I, I, I use that as a contrast to other nations, for instance, China, where they have a lot of scientists and engineers in government um, who might not be as obsessed with process. And so when you bring in uh, the technology uh, expertise that you talked about, Quite often, technology about improving process and sometimes bypassing process or blowing yeah. the process up and reinventing it. So yeah. I can imagine that that culture clash that you just referred to stems from that. Uh, you know, technology folks are always looking for a way to optimize process. And sometimes in government, well, there's probably plenty of forces that are like, we're very content with the old fashioned process that we've got, which is why we still need fax machines, you know, to talk to doctors and to send messages to a judge in a court case and so forth. Uh, Can you tell me a little bit about your experience of confronting government process and trying to change that? Yeah, one of my, uh, one article I would point people at is something called the procedure fetish by a um, law professor in uh, Michigan named Nick Bagley. Um, He really nails it. Um, There, we, we have this obsession in government with um, when we are challenged in any way, uh, the the solution is to create more procedures. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have procedure upon procedure that don't allow us to actually get the outcome that we intended. And he has a great uh, analysis of that, which is that fundamentally people in bureaucracies and sort of the thinking in government is concerned with legitimacy. And we think that we will have legitimacy by having procedures that we can fall back on. Whereas I think, you know, a different way of thinking is Legitimacy comes from serving the public, getting the outcomes that we expect. And that's a really fundamental shift that I think needs to happen. Um, He certainly, as you just did, points to the primacy of 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 lawyers in government that uh, uh, I think every Democratic president and vice president since Clinton have had law degrees. Actually, strangely, not as much on the Republican side. And and the, the Democrats get a little bit of a, a knock here for being more procedure fetishist mm-hmm. than the Republicans at times. Um, I mean, when you think about the way we criticize politicians, very often what we zoom in on is their failure to observe the niceties, the protocols, and the procedures, right? So it's not so much that they're not getting the outcome that they were elected to get. It's that they didn't go about it in the in the prescribed way. Um, and I think for regular folks, you know, civilians, if you will, yeah. we look at this, we're kind of puzzled because it's like the business world doesn't operate that way. You know, in business, who cares how you get the job done if you get the job done? Um, and a lot will be forgiven uh, if you get the result. But in politics, you can you can get the result and then be um, you can get hung up on the procedure or violating the procedure. This seems to most people to be a paradox. It's almost incomprehensible to the right to the regular person. Uh, do you think that's just a bureaucratic mindset? And as you say, uh, or I guess as as Nick Bagley says, uh, it's the obsession with trying to establish legitimacy. Um, what 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 to what do you ascribe that to? I mean, I think that um, it's really easy to criticize um, our public servants, particularly you know what I I will use the term bureaucrat with love. It's often thought of as a derogatory term. But um, I I do think we need to look in the mirror a little, and I think politicians need to look in the mirror. Those procedures are very often thrown at the bureaucracy by politicians who are Mm. upset about something. And so, and I I talk in the book about sort of the layers of policy that accrue um, in programs that make them so complex that it takes 25 years to learn, you know, the the policies and procedures that govern them. You know, when when we have... um, when we have policy complexity of that order, it's just very, very, very hard to scale. Um, but you know, ultimately, 
we hold and our and our politicians hold our public servants accountable to two totally distinct systems of accountability, right? There's, did you follow the process or did you get the outcomes? And they are trapped because uh, public servants' careers depend on being able to show that they followed the proper processes. They get dinged for doing anything out of bounds. And I've seen hundreds of public servants try to do the right thing, the thing that's actually gonna help the person who is intended to be helped by a policy or program and get in trouble for it. Whereas the person who did the safe thing, even though it meant that someone you know, wasn't gonna get their unemployment insurance check or their veterans benefits, those people get promoted. And so if the system is broken, whose responsibility is it to change the system? The bureaucrats can't change it. We have to change it. We have to hold our elected officials accountable to changing that instead of vilifying the public servants who make risk averse choices. Well, right now you see a lot of this in Congress. So, um, you know, the legislators uh, will grandstand uh, against the bureaucracy and and very often vilify what they call the deep state, right? Yes. A lot of this is overblown, in my opinion. And my own experience with public servants is that they're well-intended. You know, they're people yes. who are actually foregoing maybe a more profitable career in the private sector in order to serve the public. And they take that pretty seriously. Um, but it's pretty easy. They're a pretty easy target for politicians uh, to rail against. So, you know, every few years we see this, a new politician comes in from the outside and he's going to drain the swamp or whatever they say, uh, and then runs into this bure- morass of bureaucracy. And then that becomes the villain. And we just saw that all play out with the, with the Ra- uh, sorry, with the Trump administration, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, in a very dramatic way, you know, where I think it's really damaged uh, the perception of some of the institutions or the, you know, the people's convictions and faith in the government. Yeah. So that that sort of populist railing isn't very effective ultimately because it's not really attending to the issue. The issue is uh, Congress saddles the bureaucracy with a set of obligations but without giving them the resources to get the job done necessarily and without giving them very clear guidelines. Yeah, I would agree. They, they don't give them the resources, but I want to be clear that I think there's a lot of money going into government. Um, what they don't give them is the freedom to use their discretion to get the job done. Um, you know, I just spent uh, some some time with an economist um, who kept saying, you know, we starve government by design. There's some truth to that, and there's truth to it in certain areas. But I think it's also true that we starve government of design. We don't let them design uh, programs, uh, technology services that work. We tell them, here's the law, just translate it directly into, you know, a service that those things don't really work for people. And so I I, want to shift the conversation around what resources government needs. We can get much, much better outcomes with the funding that we currently have if we think of design. And I mean design in sort of the technology sense, design of services, design of of programs, design of of, of regulation. Um as a core competency of government. We just don't think that way. We think design talent belongs in tech, in tech, Mm -hmm. designing, you know, the latest thing that we're all going to love work, you know, using. Um, The best, highest use of design is in government. (laughs) Yeah, that's Uh, a really good point. I mean, that's just, this is a principal claim that you make in your book, uh, Recoding America. Tell us a little bit about what you're trying to accomplish in that book. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to shift how people think um, about their relationship to government, their responsibility to making a government that works, um, and ultimately to have everybody, whether it's just anybody who cares about democracy or public elected public officials or leaders in uh, administrative agencies, see the opportunity that we have to um, adopt these different ways of thinking Mm -hmm. so that we can let all the tech talent that wants to come into government and make a difference actually make that difference. Um, I I do think while there are a number of very specific tactics and strategies that I propose in the book targeted at lawmakers or the general public or government leaders, ultimately it does come down to that what are the capacities and competencies that we have, you know, that we need government to have today, not the ones that they had in 1970. Mm -hmm. What are the capacities and competencies that government needs to succeed today? And how do we build them? Um, Those are, 
understanding what has changed and how we need to catch up is the is the foundation for any of those changes. So I think it gets back to what I said earlier. There are people willing, both inside the bureaucracies and outside in the tech industry and in the leadership. How do we create the conditions, which I think are really about how people think about this problem, for all that talent and good intentions to come together and actually make a difference? How are we going to allow people in government to create uh, technology and services that people love using so that they stop feeling frustrated. I mean, Rob, you mentioned, um, you know, the Trump years and uh, that sort of disregard for the deep state, the disregard for the, um, the bureaucracy and the wanting to blow it all up. I completely agree. But I also want to recognize that when people have very frustrating experiences with government, they do want to blow it up. That's part of why we have this desire for a strong man to come in and just take over and and not have, you know, a thousand stakeholders and, you know, uh, interfaces to government that are 212 questions and don't work on mobile phones. They're overburdened. They want something simple and clear. And they think that an autocrat can give us that. Um, That's the wrong answer, but it's coming from a place of real frustration. We have to address that frustration um, or we're going to get more of this um, this populist and autocratic tendencies in uh, in the public. And we're going to have that in our government. Which, which branch of the federal government has the power to address that? Uh, is that the legislature? Is that the executive? Does the Supreme Court play a role in this? Tell me a little bit how you envision this change getting implemented. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the answer to that is all of them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right. And also that it's not just government. Again, it's how we, the people, hold our elected officials accountable. Um, what we ask them to actually spend their time on and look at how, like you mentioned, grandstanding, how we expect them to behave. Are they supporting the creation of these competencies and capacities that we need? Or are they just yelling at the deep state? <laughs> um, but yes, the legislatures have to look in the mirror and see how they're contributing to the problem. The executive branch, especially the administrative agencies, have to change their ways. They need support from both the legislative and the judicial branches to do that. Talk a lot in the book about the ways in which the, judici- the judiciary has sort of bled into the administrative agencies and made everything like incredibly hard to do, taking yeah. 10 years of jurisdiction uh, and adjudication um, to do it. So change needs to happen everywhere. And we've got to change to support all this. I mean, even now with the Supreme Court, uh, you know, leaning right, they're starting to challenge the, the administration's ability to regulate, right? They're starting to undo sometimes 70 years worth of regulatory apparatus or neutralize it, I guess. And I mean, that just sends the problem back to the legislature. And candidly, Congress is broken right now. Congress can't get anything done. So asking them to solve a complex problem like regulatory apparatus is, I think, a pretty tall order. But that looks like uh, that looks like the direction the Supreme Court is leaning right now. It's terrifying, actually, because I think the thing we need more it desperately is the ability of the administrative agencies to do the job the American public expects them to do. Yeah. And when the Supreme Court says, actually, let's cut them off at the knees one more time, cripple them from being able to do anything, um, uh, we we are really, really in a da- we're in really dangerous territory here because the American public expects those things to happen. For sure, they're paying for it, and we pay a lot for government. You know, so so we expect we have we have high expectations. Uh, one of the problems is is that there's a certain level of expertise required. If you think about, you know, um, environmental regulation, banking regulation, transportation regulation, you need people who have the technical acumen to make intelligent decisions. But by definition, that's not a politician that's been elected to Congress. They have a different skill set. I'm not saying they don't have expertise, but they don't have expertise in that domain. Um, and so, you know, we've seen this in other fields. People who are good at one thing tend to you know, place high emphasis on what they know well, and they place less emphasis or less value on the stuff that they don't know that well. I think we have a really great uh, illustration of that. It's really easy to bash regulators. It's really easy to bash the, uh, let's say the bureaucrats, the people who are there to administer these rules and regulations uh, without really having a deep, deep understanding of the complex challenges that they face. And in every one of those areas, the complex challenges we face are in large part technological. 
And that area is increasing in complexity. Uh, so then, in other words, the need for uh, needs for experience and expertise seems to be going up, not down. Um, but this drive for populism and this drive for simple solutions is going in the exact opposite direction. It can't possibly get us there. Why don't you respond to that a little bit? We'll need to go to a break in a moment. Um, I think I, I think, again, the culture of government is just going to have to change to understand what kinds of skills and approaches we need and and value. I, I talk in the book about um, my experience in the White House and the resistance that I met and compare it back to um, the 90s when uh, two members of Congress wanted to put, you know, responsibility for tech strategy in the White House back then and the resistance that they got. Um, the line from uh, the deputy director for management in OMB, the Office of Management and Budget at the time was, um, that's not, uh, having tech expertise in the White House is inconsistent with the policy nature of this institution. It's it's operational in nature and therefore doesn't belong here. Hmm. And that's been there all along and it's still there. Uh, but yet the president is, in some respects, the president, whoever is elected president from whatever party, that person is suddenly put in charge of like 260 organizations. It's like being the CEO of 260 different companies, each of which has deep expertise, deep operational expertise. So I'm having a hard time understanding how that skill of managing complex operations isn't the primary criteria for president. I would agree. I think the criteria that we hold for both elected officials and, say, the president's cabinet, for instance, mm -hmm. is um, needs some rethinking. We yeah. we are so eager to put in people who can dream up big ideas, and so reluctant to uh, to actually value the skills of making those ideas real. It's interesting, like when you think about how a CEO is recruited for a big corporation. Literally none of the criteria that we use to an elected president are used to hire a CEO for a private organization. It's a completely different set of criteria. Okay, on that note, listen, we are going to go to break, but before we do, we have this custom that we like to do on the show where we ask you a series of short questions just to get more familiar with you, where you're coming from. Um, and so uh, what we tend to do is ask people what inspires them about the future. So for the first quick question, these are short answers. Tell me, what's the first science fiction story that inspired you? It could be a movie or a book or a comic book. I think science fiction wise, this is, um, you know, I guess if you're going first, you have to go Madeline Longle and uh, uh, Wrinkle in Time. Right. Um, just uh, all those books. Um, I mean, I guess they're sort of borderline science fiction, but they were very yeah, fantasy. It's a sort of a middle schooler. <laughs> yeah, the things that get you thinking uh, about this. And then in your career, where's the, when's the first time you noticed that technology can actually make a positive change in society? Well, I would say working in the games industry, um, mm -hmm. where you and I know each other from. Um, honestly, started doing that, didn't really, you know, wasn't a big gamer, but I think that that you know, on some level, I think what I got out of that was sort of this ambition and um, willingness to sort of create new worlds that um, it's it's a it's a power, I think, that when I went into government, I wanted to bring that sort of um, ambition to the folks there and say, no, it's possible to not only change things, but to really reinvent the world around us. After the break, we'll talk a little bit more about your experience uh, in the games field, because I think it's relevant, too. Um, tell me about a forecast or a prediction that impressed you, like if you can think of any forecast or, or prediction that inspired your career. Um, you want a positive one? <laughs> Either way. No, whatever. Either way. Um, Something that made a I big impression on you. I think the um, the forecast that is most front of mind for me right now is um, how well we will be prepared for the next pandemic. Mm. Oh, okay. You know, it's interesting. COVID-19 has to be one of the most forecasted things. The idea of a global pandemic, you know, for years, people have been talking about it. Uh, you know, there, were, there, uh, there, were, there was a book called The Next Plague written 20 years before the pandemic. It's not like we didn't have a fair warning. So there's this sort of Cassandra syndrome where you can yeah. forecast something with great accuracy 
And yet the people in charge don't pay attention to it. Okay, well, on that dim note, let's take a little break. We'll come back in a few minutes. You're listening to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tursik, and our guest this week is Jennifer Palka. Hang in there tight. We'll be back in just a minute after this. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce, and support The Futurist podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the Fintech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network, and Next Gen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to provoke.fm or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. Hey, welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tursik, and this week we're interviewing Jennifer Palka, who has just completed and is about to publish a new book from Macmillan called Recoding America. Hey, Jen, before the break, we were talking about the Game Developer Conference, and this is probably going to come as a curveball to the people who are listening to the show, because so far the conversation has been about government and bureaucracy and elected officials and the criteria for the president and so forth. And I think people listening to this now may be saying, the Game Developer Conference, what the heck? So where Jennifer and I met was in the late 1990s when she was leading uh, CMP Group's Game Developer Conference, which is the oldest and most prestigious game gathering of game developers in the world. Um, Originally, it started in Chris Crawford's kitchen when the game industry, the very fledgling game industry, uh, everyone knew each other in that field. They would get together to talk about what the best practices were. Um, Over the years, it evolved a little bit more into almost like an academic conference where different game developers would sketch out uh, their ideas in the form of white papers that they would share. And then the conference was a place to share those ideas. And um, I had been following it for years and then finally uh, attended and spoke and joined the board uh, when Jennifer was in charge. And I found it to be a remarkable, a remarkable meeting place because you could have companies that were direct competitors gathering together to share ideas. Uh, And I remember really clearly at one point, because I was working for Sony at the time, uh, and when I joined the board, the request was, hey, can we get Sony more involved in this? And I remember very clearly the Japanese game companies said, you Americans, we don't understand how you do this. The information you're sharing is what we consider to be proprietary information. We're not in the habit of sharing that with our competitors. And our response, I remember very clearly, you and Alan, you were like, look, the reason the game industry grows and grows and doubles and doubles and doubles in size is precisely because we share the information openly with our competitors. Our vision is let's make better games. And it's okay if our competitors make better games too. That was a powerful idea. Well, you know, that was 25 years ago. Yikes. Here we are today and games is this dominant colossus. It's by far the most vital and most uh, fast growing game, uh, entertainment or media business in the world. And it is really quite extraordinary because today, three and a half billion people play video games, uh, either on a console or a PC or mainly on a mobile phone. So that's an extraordinary growth. Uh, and it largely comes from the open sharing of information and the willingness of direct competitors to sit down in a neutral environment and share ideas, exchange ideas with each other and hammer through the standardization topics. You know, where do we need things to be standardized and aligned so that we can compete better on top of that? Mm-hmm. Jennifer, tell me a little bit about your experience managing that because you weren't necessarily a gamer when you joined that group, but you did lead it to some great growth and you learned a lot along the way. Tell me a little bit about CMP and the Game Developer Conference. Yeah, I think it changed my life and it changed my perspective um, uh, about how people use creativity and technology. So um, to see the way that... Um, particularly back in, I guess it was 95 that we started, um, there were huge constraints in the technology then. Uh, You could not do most of the things that you can do today. And yet the developers really felt that creativity is driven by those constraints. And I think they really showed that, but they weren't limited by them. They used them as a jumping off point to do something cooler and cooler and cooler. And then, of course, you had the technology moving along. And every time there you know, was a constraint removed by greater processing power, better tools, 
they 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 jumped on those too and made something amazing out of them. Um, but I think it's a way of thinking that that feeds into what I said earlier. I mean, they really believed because they they could and they did every day that they could create worlds that people could step into and they could create any world they wanted. They could create a world that reflected the society we live in. They could create a world that questioned the society we live in. And they played with those and they use those to change our culture. Um, not just the culture of games, but you know our culture. And they use that to say, this is not just an entertainment medium. This is a meaningful form of art that, that's going to have a big impact. And um, I just, as somebody who had not been into tech until then, got so much out of that way of thinking. Um, and uh, I love I love to see that ethos uh, applied anywhere technology can be put to use, especially in government. Um, and I think the other thing that you said about the collaboration, you would think in government that uh, there would be more collaboration. It's supposed to it's supposed to be the opposite of proprietary. But because you do actually get um, some of that sort of Japanese um, response in government because people get siloed and they're not talking across boundaries. I mean, the key thing that is beautiful in the games industry in terms of the way that teams work is that they're cross-functional. Like mm -hmm. I thought of programmers as being like, they sit there and writing code and then you have but now they're artists too, and they're working side by side with artists and sound designers and story developers. And they they can't be in silos or they can't make a good game. Cross-functional teams in some ways are like the solution, at least the tactical solution to getting great government services. And I, I just, so many of the pieces of the game industry, I think really have stuck with me and, and um, informed my thinking through the rest of my career. It's interesting because the game industry is sort of the opposite of bureaucracy in the sense that gamers, uh, game developers just cut through. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the folks who are listening, it may not have occurred to some of the folks listening to the show that, you know, every time you buy a new computer or a new phone or a new PlayStation, magically, there's a lot of new games that are available for it the day you buy it. If you think about that, you go, wait, this phone just came out like yesterday. How are there so many games available for it? Well, that's because game developers often will be part of a developer program that gives them early access to those devices when there isn't full documentation. In other words, there is no like recipe book on how to build an app for that particular device. Game developers don't care. They figure it out. They just go for it. They're like, fine, tell me what this thing can do. Okay, let me try it out and I'll figure it out. And then they develop a game around that. It's incredibly creative use of technology, but they're working in a completely unsupported uh, environment where they're on their own and that's okay with them. So in, in terms of technology, my view is game developers are by far the most creative technologists that are out there. And they're also kind of fearless. You know, they're willing to take on uh, an unprecedented yeah. challenge. There's plenty of other aspects of technology where they're fearless and willing to take on problems of big scale and so forth. But the requirements here are uh, that it has to be understandable. The product has to be understandable by the average person. And this is another place where government can learn. Uh, what game developers are extraordinarily good at is developing an interface that doesn't require you to read a manual. You don't have to go through a tutorial. You just yeah. pick up the phone and, or you know, console or whatever it is, uh, and you start playing and you figure it out as you go. And this is ab absolutely brilliant psychology, like user psychology. I don't think any game developer would describe themselves as a psychologist, but that's clearly what they're doing. They're thinking through carefully, like, how can we have software that teaches people how to use it? without forcing them to go through some long-winded narrative or read a manual or go through a tutorial or some sort of training process. You just pick it up and you start playing and the game kind of teaches you how to go. This is a very elegant approach to, che to teaching people. And I would say that uh, mobile games in particular, since they now reach billions of people, have really conditioned or trained a huge number of people. Like something like one third of humanity now uh, has been conditioned to these interfaces without having to go through any kind of training or any kind of instruction manual. There's a lesson there for government, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, look, think at any government form. Let's start with taxes. You're going to file or even just like, please, I, think I just printed please, it. Up. Let's not start with taxes. <laughs> okay. Let's start smaller than that. Um, I just happened to print like my W, like the request for a W9 or something. It was on my printer right before I came over here. It's a form that's got like what 25 boxes on it it comes with five pages of instructions yeah 
why do we need five pages of instructions to put, to answer those many questions? Because the questions aren't intuitive. Yeah. So I, I tell a story in the book. This is, you know, um, there's certainly a lesson there just about the um, administrative burden that we put on people. Um, it's I have a stat in the book, and I'm sorry, I don't remember it now, but it's the, you know, millions or billions of hours a year that we make people fill out government forms from the federal mm -hmm. and local level, uh, which increases our um, frustration with and erodes our support of government. Um but the stakes are really higher than just that administrative burden. Um, I tell a story in the book, Recoding America, out June 13th, um, about a really fantastic team at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, that really are designing um, you know, interfaces. This is in this case for doctors, right? Doctors have to submit for reimbursement in Medicare. And um there's a moment after the ACA, after healthcare.gov, when uh, CMS gets its next big policy that it needs to implement. Of course, they're going to implement it through technology, through a website that people use, need to use. And it's very clear at that moment that doctors already hate the way that they're supposed to fill out these forms, their online forms. Um, they feel like they don't understand what's being asked of them. They don't know when they're asked for a piece of data, if it's you know, if what they're giving them is actually what's asked for. And if they get it wrong, they will not be reimbursed. Um, and then when we do uh, value-based care, it's even worse than that, because if they get it wrong, they're like their multiplier goes down. And um, it's it's a terrible experience for them. Yeah, terrible, terrible. I immigration is another example. If you've ever helped someone go through the process of immigrating to the U.S., three different federal agencies, they don't agree, different forms. And if you get one little thing wrong, uh, your application just gets stopped and you don't even know which agency stopped it. So it can be quite complex to navigate. And let's also add to the mix, most of the people who are doing this don't speak English as their first language. So there's there's also the language barrier they have to overcome. And you yeah, get asked like, things up front, like tell me every single time you've been out of the country for more than 24 hours in the past five years, yeah. which they could ask you later when you're further down the the process, but you're, you're asked for it in a 20 page form to begin the naturalization process. That's not designed. That's just throwing all the requirements in a form. Yeah. Those are all hurdles to completion. And if you get one piece wrong, uh, you get, you get dinged for it. Um, okay. Now people listening to this, I know some people listening to this are going to be saying, hang on a second. Are you guys saying that we should have game developers design the interface for the government? That's a preposterous idea, but but are there lessons that you learned in the game development world that you think might apply? Well, I think this team that I was describing that faced um, implementing this this new policy after the ACA um, were as creative and bold as game developers. So, you know, they were looking at these these doctors saying, um, "I hate the interface we have now, but this new policy is going to make you recreate it. We're going to have something just as bad, but I have to relearn it." And the impact of that was going to be that doctors were going to leave Medicare. Uh, talk about a, a pr prediction. The prediction was a mass exodus of doctors from taking Medicare as a, you know, they're just going to say, never mind, we're not going to take Medicare patients. Well, that's going to degrade the quality of care mm -hmm. when the intention of the law was to improve the quality of care. And what this team did is they sort of took charge and they said, we're going to fight to make all of the regulations actually work. So, for example, you know, one of the first things um, they they found was that you have to, as a doctor, say whether you're part of a group or an individual uh, in, you know, in private practice. And there were nine different definitions of what a group was. Well, that is not going to, as they said, it doesn't make sense to a person. You're you're not. It's 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 that incredibly legalistic, overburdened kind of um, way of, of interfacing. And they didn't just say, "Okay, well, there's nine definitions. We'll design around it." They said, "We have to reduce it." They didn't get to one. They got to two. But choices like that, where they pushed back, gave them the ability to design something that did make sense to a person. But they really had to sort of take the reins and say, "We're not going to just do what we're told here." In the end, when they shipped that new uh, website that doctors had to use for this new policy, they 
were so surprised. The doctors were so surprised that they called the call center to say something must be wrong. This is too easy. <laughs> this actually makes sense to me. What happened to the medic, you know, the centers for Medicare and Medicaid services that I knew and hate, right? Like <laughs> it is absolutely possible. Um, and I do think that those, uh, I don't think that that team would think of themselves as having channeled game developers, but mm -hmm. they definitely said it is our job to design something that makes sense to a person and people, doctors didn't leave Medicare. Oh, that's great. That's super. How long did that take? How many months did that take? Um, I think they had basically a two year window from the passage of the law to the rollout of the of the new website, but like, it's very complicated because in those two year window, you have the the um, agency actually doing the regulation that they have to implement. Oh, so they're writing, they're actually writing the law. Well, okay, yeah, but but that's actually pretty fast, right? Like you have to have the the those, those designers, those technologists, those implementers helping write the regulation. It can't mm -hmm. be this waterfall. You have to you have to mix it up and have it be more of a circular collaborative process. Oh, how amenable it. are they to that kind of feedback from the designers? Is that an uphill battle? It's an uphill battle, but it's yeah. going to change the more we highlight and celebrate people like that team at CMS who did it. Smart. Okay, that's great. Now, right now we're experiencing this, uh, you know, I guess I would call it an arms race in the tech world uh, yeah. to launch the next new platform, which is probably going to involve artificial intelligence. So it seems like that's the big game. We're all going right to involve now. artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah. And Microsoft is leading the fray by partnership with OpenAI. Uh, they're rolling out a version of GPT-4 in all their products. And what's interesting to me about that is that they launched, um, you know, the Bing version, the, the 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 search engine that you can talk to, basically Bing with Chat GPT. They launched that when they knew perfectly well it wasn't ready for prime time. It was filled with flaws. Um, and you know, some journalists like Kevin Roos at the New York Times were able to very easily kind of provoke the thing, the AI, into some very aberrant behavior, including you know, like uh, personality changes and weird, threatening comments, and and you know, stuff that frankly very entertaining, was, wasn't it? <laughs> it was it was brilliantly fun to read about and and, and experience, but. Uh, if the government were to do that, there'd be tremendous amounts of backlash. You can just imagine the political nightmare that that would create. It was bad enough when when healthcare.gov flopped, uh, you know, and that was just a tech fail. Here we have something that's like openly hostile and weird. What's interesting to me is that Microsoft didn't back down like they did with Tay yeah. just a few years ago in 2018. They pulled that first chatbot because it, it went out of control. This time they stuck to their guns and they said, look, we're training an AI. It's going to take some time. It might not give you accurate answers. Uh, but roll with it because it'll get better over time. And interesting thing, first of all, users didn't seem to mind. They actually kind of like the fact that there's a quirky uh, a personality, at least some do. And Wall Street didn't mind. Well, you know, Microsoft stock is trading at, at, at 52 week highs right now, in spite of the fact that this is a clearly a product that isn't really ready for prime time. Can the government ever come close to that? Can the government ever take a risk like that and launch software that is in like a trial mode? And even if they put guardrails around it and say like, here's an experimental interface, but we just want to see how people use it. Is that a possibility or is that, am I, is it, is it just, uh, is it just a too far, a bridge too far for the government? I think the answer is yes. And increasingly they are. Um, oh, cool. uh, the, our friends at the government digital service in the UK pioneered the idea of just you know, you throw out a website early and you label an alpha or a beta. They mm -hmm. call it beta because they're British. Beta. Beta. <laughs> um, and say, yeah, this this is for us to for you to play with and give us feedback on. It is not a final product. Um, we have not done that as much in the US, but I, I would point, for instance, to covidtest.gov, um, which is a great way of wrapping up a bunch of the lessons that I think government's learned over the past 10 years. Um, one of which is um, simply they made choices, right? And healthcare.gov was incredibly overscoped. It was trying to do every imaginable thing, serve every single edge case from day one. I haven't seen a technology that does that well ever. Um, you you have to start small and roll out the way that, or at least start, I guess, with the case of um, ChatGPT, it's more start flawed and 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 increase it. Um, but they they made the choices to not collect a bunch of information, to not try to do anything fancy, but to have a very simple form online that would allow people to request COVID tests. Um, but one thing that they did was they, you know, they, yeah, they got, did they get something wrong? Yeah, they, not necessarily something that they could have fixed, 
Um, there were complaints about the fact that if you lived in a multi-unit building, some of those people would type in their address and it would say, I'm sorry, uh, COVID tests have already been requested for your building. Well, it turned out that it's simply that the, you know, the address database that the USPS uses has not been kept up. If you had a, 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 a big house that's been split up into six units, no one's ever told the post office. So that mm-hmm. still shows as a single unit. Um, our wonderful uh, postal delivery people just saw that there were now, you know, different apartment numbers and put the mail in the right places because they're doing the right thing. But the address never, the address database never got fixed. And instead of obsessing on this as a huge failure, they said, great, this is a way to fix our database. And oh, they asked fine. anybody who was having that problem to contact them. They verified it. And they and actually, I think they got something like 70% of their data cleaned in three weeks. Wow. So you turn this, you turn this example of like, oh, a problem into a solution um, by uh, by taking advantage of, of of errors and taking advantage of the fact that you're actually interacting with people, which is what Microsoft's doing. Like, yeah. we're not going to be able to test it without actual people. Like, you run out of like testers inside the building in you know in Redmond. Um, I think that's true of government too. I would say I think government is trying more and more to do this, and the way that we can support them is that when something like covidtest.gov has a glitch like that is to report on it and see it as a positive and not yell at them all the time. Mm -hmm. It was fine. Those people did get their tests. And it's unfortunate, of course, in that particular case. And as is often the case that the people who have the harder time are the ones with least resources. Mm -hmm. We do need to acknowledge that, but we also need to say government needs to be able to try things and learn through actual working with people instead of trying to get it perfect before it's ever launched. Okay. In our remaining time, we like to focus on big, big picture future thinking. And so I want you to put on your futurist hat and think about government in the, in the future. I'm going to set this up by saying we yeah. face some formidable challenges, uh, you know, climate change being one of them that seems to confront us across every aspect of the economy and society, as much as there's still a group that d- denies that it's even a factor I think most industry is starting to come around to the fact that climate change is a big issue. Um, but in addition to that, we've got a, a you know a populace that's riven by politics. We have deep political rifts. Uh, we have uh, increasing technological change, including artificial intelligence, that may displace a lot of workers. That's a real strong possibility. We don't have great social social safety net. Uh, crazy problems unique to the United States, like the proliferation of guns. Um, and this rash of violence, gun violence that are facing us. So given all those kind of major challenges uh, and the fact that the U.S. government is dealing with software that in some cases is 50 years old, you know, this kind of, it's a, uh, a system. That even. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, that's really frightening if you think about it. Uh, you know, it's like they're dragging these systems from the past into the 21st century and trying to retrofit them to rapidly changing circumstances. Given all that, oh, how optimistic are you that the federal government is going to be able to rise to the occasion and meet the demands of the 21st century using the technology resources that it has? I'm optimistic, but my caveat is it's going to depend on whether we support them in that or not. I mean, as much as everyone wants to say that the government is no longer responsive to our needs and that there has been a sort of disjuncture between what we want out of government and what we get, Money and politics is a big problem in that. It is still essentially accountable to us. Mm-hmm. Um, so we will need to change how we hold government accountable in order to make that happen. Um, but I do think that there's so much will, both inside and outside government. There's so much talent that wants to go there. And there's so much frustration with the status quo um, that we're at a breaking point. I, I hope that the book um, challenges people um, to think about this. And I and I mean a lot of different kinds of people. There are people in all sorts of roles um, whose thinking needs to change and whose behavior needs to change for us to get there. But we are ripe for that moment and we're ripe for that change. Fabulous. Well, Jennifer Palka, the author of Recoding America and the founder of Code for America, the former deputy chief technology officer of the United States of America, Thank you very much for joining us. Where can people find you on the web and where can they find your book, Recoding America? Uh, 
the book, you can you can go to recodingamerica.us. Um, you can go to jenniferpolka.com. Uh, and the book will be in bookstores and anywhere you find books on June 13th. Great. Thanks it's so been much, a real Jen. pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for coming on The Futurists. And of course, it's great to reconnect with you after such a long time. Congrats this on all your success. Thank you for joining us this week. This was so fun, Robert. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that. That's great feedback. I want to give a big uh, shout out of thanks to Kevin Hirschman, our engineer, and to our producer, Elizabeth, and to the whole crew at Provoke Media that make the show possible, and my co-host, Brett King, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. I know he was looking forward to it. Folks, if you like the show, uh, please let other, let other people know about it. Uh, we're very happy with the progress we're making. The Futurist, I'm told, is now the number one future podcast on all platforms, which is ex extremely exciting for us. Let's keep it growing. Uh, help other people find it by giving us a five-star review if you like the show and share it with your friends. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you in the future. Well, that's it for The Futurists this week. If you like the show, we sure hope you did. Please subscribe and share it with the people in your community. And don't forget to leave us a five-star review. That really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.